So we're going to go ahead and start with Tommy. I'm going to have all four of the presenters give their talks, uh, and then we will have question and answer after that. All right. So welcome. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Tommy. Um, I'm really sorry. I'm kind of reading off the paper. Um, I know it hasn't been the case this today. Uh, I'm already up, I guess. <laughs> um, but my talk is uh, called Prison Cryptopia Fair Play in the UK Space. Um, I've already been introduced, but I'm a game designer studying in Toronto. Uh, so I'll start. So on November 7th, 1967, the Supreme Court of Canada sentenced Everett Clipper, Clipper to prison for gross indecency, a legal term to criminalize the sexual activity between men. Within six weeks, Pierre Trudeau, the then Justice Minister in the Liberal Party, introduced Beast, uh, Bill C-195, which was later passed as Bill C-150, the Criminal Law Amendment Act. Inspired by the Sexual Offenses Act passed by the British Parliament one year earlier, Bill C-150 legalized homosexual acts, quote, between men over the age of 21 performed in private. Trudeau's famous words, there's no place for the state in the bedroom of the nations, were spoken in defense of this bill. Although the legalization of private space supposedly liberated a certain group of people, queer spaces haven't always been easily definable in terms such as public versus private. Many queer spaces take shape within the margins and on the border of the Nally, mirroring the real world are unique spaces that have their own mechanic and, their rule and rules of play. In this paper, I shall map out and draw connections between the constellations of different queer spaces throughout history. In doing so, I aim to explore some possible lines of intersection between queer spaces that exist physically and um, and virtual queer spaces and video games. In particular, I'll be looking at the significance of play and gameness in such spaces in order to develop, in order to develop crucial inroads into the conceptual field of queer game studies. So, in 1967, Michel Foucault presented a lecture at the Center of Architectural Studies called Of Other Spaces, Utopia and Heterotopias. Foucault described the properties of heterotopic spaces as other arrangements. So these are unlike utopia, they're real spaces, but um, they have material properties that lie outside all places, and yet they're actually localizable. So because utopias have always existed in kind of fantasy, heterotopias are actually real spaces. Um, Foucault was influenced by children playing games, such as using bed sheets as, uh, to create portals into fantastical worlds that produce different spaces while at the same time mirroring what is around them. Foucault just defines heterotopias as counter spaces. They challenge the space we live in. Using mirror as the analogy, as an analogy, he describes heterotopias as worlds within worlds. If we look into the mirror, the place does not actually exist. But at the same time, the mirror does exist. We can see and observe ourselves in the mirror. Foucault hints at the disembodied and embodied effects of looking into the mirror. As he continues, the mirror does exist and has a kind of comeback effect on the place I occupy. Staring from it, in fact, I find myself absent from the place I'm currently in, in that I find I see myself in there, the mirror. So for Foucault, witnessing the virtuality of the mirrored image is both bodily and out-of-body experience. This understanding suggests that the virtual can actualize real causality and can produce disembodied and embodied effects in its subjects. Yet the most intriguing um, and unexplored aspect of heterotopias is Foucault's original influence, child play. The origins of play in heterotopias can trace back to um, a Dutch historian John Hussinger's seminal book called Homo Ludens, in which he discussed the importance of the element of play in culture and society and positions play as a pre-civilized human activity that is resistant to capitalism and rationalization. So Foucault also shares, um, heterotopia also share many qualities with the Hussinger's concept of the magic circle. The magic circle uh, describes a place, a space in which normal rules of reality in the physical material world are suspended and replaced by the rules and the mechanics of the game world. So using the uh, like soccer match as an example, the magic circle serves to create a temporary boundary of play in which new rules are enforced. So kicking a ball into a net is no longer just kicking a ball into a net, it now means scoring a goal. The magic circle may not necessarily have physical boundaries, the players of the uh, game agree on them before entering the magic circle. Both magic circles and heterotopias exist um, conterminously, as in they share borders, and they are with and within real spaces. So but what about queer spaces? If we use the same terms and rules to describe heterotopias and magic circles um, to describe queer spaces, we might be able to start to uncover some of its gameness. So queer spaces have always existed as a type of real utopia 
for Heliopia, for the LGBTQ community, protecting, from, protecting them from the besieging world outside. Many of these uh, spaces are temporary, coming and going in fleeting moments. These spaces can exist without any built structure and carved from within heteronormatively coded space. In the book, Queer Sites, Gay, Urban History Since the 1600s, author David Hicks described the curious history of Molly houses in the 18th and 19th century England. Molly houses were private meeting sites for gay men that took place mostly in private, um, in pubs, taverns, and coffee houses after hours. They were an opportunity for gay men to socialize with the community and meet potential sexual partners. Um, and the patrons of Molly houses also participated in live action role play. They cross-dressed in a variety of different female roles and performed mock births and rituals that celebrated, celebrated the matriarch and the feminine. In the 17th century, cruising, a predominantly male practice where people seek casual sex in public spaces, was another queering space that started to become documented first in England, then in other major urban centers across Europe. And then lastly, men having sex in public baths have been documented since as early as the 15th century. Uh, first in Italy, and then now the, the modern day bathhouses that we know of today have been in, in existence since the 1950s. So for those who have never been cruising or to a gay bathhouse, the rules are pretty simple. You take off as many pieces of clothing as you want, and this kind of determines how others will interact with you. Um, perhaps similar to choosing your player avatar in a multiplayer online game. Once you're ready, you enter the magic circle and navigate the maze-like space until you encounter one or more person. If interested, you would engage with them with no words, just gestures. Then with consent, you can have sex. You can have whatever kind of sex you want with them. And once over, you can choose to exit the space or continue depending on the goal you have set for that evening. So all these spaces that I just talked about, they, they can be described as a type, a type of heterotopia, heterotopia, a magic circle, that has a negotiated entry, a set of boundaries, mechanic and rules of play that suspend the normal rules of reality, a goal or goals, and an end that signifies the exit of the game. Understanding the queer spaces through its ludic qualities or the gayness of these spaces unleashes the potential for such spaces um, for possible radical political imagination and action. So early on in this paper, I kind of just touched upon two types of games, this really lightly like sports and live action role play. Um, but now let's draw our attention to video games. Video games are virtual magic circles, and they share many qualities with heterotropias. They suspend your presence in physical reality and momentarily place you inside another world. Video games also have real causal effect on your physical body while you're inside the virtual one. So, like for example, when I play video games, at least I develop really bodily and visceral reactions to the game itself. Um, for example, when my player avatar falls, I kind of feel a sense of vertical. Um, and there's also extensive documentation online, online forums, where players react really emotionally to what's happening in the video game. Um, in part, of course, this should be attributed to the storytelling of the game itself, but um, the story is only made possible through the stage of the game space. So if we conceive video games as heterotopic spaces, um, then this suggests a potential um, point of conceptual intersection with a long history of queering space. So I'm going to have just three examples of video games. Um, and they're pretty popular, two are indie and one is um, AAA. Um, the first is Robert Yang's Tea Room. Um, Robert Yang's Tea Room, the game starts by informing you that you are at a highway roadside public toilet in Mansfield, Ohio, in the year is 1962. You walk into the toilet and you start the game, and you immediately stand in one spot in front of the urinals. In a few seconds, a man walks in. You make eye contact with him for a brief moment, but he quickly glances away, walks to the urinal next to you, and then zips his pants. Now you have to strategically make eye contact to flirt with him in order to get him to walk over to you. Once he does, you get on your knees, and you do, you give him the blowjob. After the ritual is completed, he walks away and you wait for the next man. No words were exchanged throughout this whole interaction. Um, so this is kind of like a really literal represent uh, query space through like a simulation of gay sex. Second, also a really popular indie game, is uh, Throwback Studio Gone Home. Um, the player takes the role of a sister that comes back to an empty family home after a year of backpacking. The family home, the origin of where heteronormative values were first introduced and ingrained into children, and perhaps a place of trauma for many queer folks, is subverted by the game. Um, the player takes on a journey of exploration, and uh, you 
discovering unearthed artifacts that gave you snippets of your sister's lesbian romance. The game climaxes and ends when you discover your sister has ran away with the lover, leaving the site of the nuclear family behind. The game itself is kind of scary because it's like a complete empty home, and like if you play games, you, you when you see an empty home, you're like immediately really scared. But like for me, this was the most terrifying moment. It was like seeing this family portrait was like, oh my god. <laughs> um, and lastly, uh, Life is Strange, the only AAA game that uh, is an example. It doesn't have an explicit queer story, though it does kind of have a little bit if you choose that route. Um, but what's really interesting about this game is that it queer stays through its time traveling mechanics. The game is mostly set at a high school, and a player takes a role of a high school girl that soon discovers her time rewinding superpowers through photography. The goal of the game is to catch and put away a cast of rapey, misogynist male characters that terrorize high school girls. And the, uh, its time rewinding mechanics is significant. Queer theorists such as Elizabeth Freeman have written on um, time uh, and the, sorry, written on that time as a product of capitalism and heteronormativity. Moreover, there's a long history of gay writers who write on being on a stuck in time or born too late. This rewinding of time or queering of time informs how the player queers a, queers a variety of heteronormative spaces like the high school in order to take down these antagonistic and toxic men. So video games through queer play allow players to connect with other forms of social, cultural, and material practices as forms of site-specific spatial, spatial insurgency. They represent a series of arena within which human creativity and sexual, ima sexual imagination are radically combined. So to conclude, um, studies in queer play and queer spaces have, such as Cruising and Molly Houses have demonstrated that concepts of heterotopia can provide a powerful conceptual link to an understanding of sexuality as shaped and formed by the materiality of space. Um, and this paper suggests that the querying of video game space to open up new possible interpretations of virtual spaces through a new materialist and spatial understanding of sexualities in video games. Um, in my last example, I attempted to move my analysis beyond just queer games and queer space itself as a politics of spatial appropriation towards a more enriched engagement uh, to the complexity of querying space and querying video games itself to open up previous and modest lines of intersection. In the late 1960s, heterotopias and magic circles influenced political activism such as um, the 1968 student uprising in Paris. Perhaps then, um, through creating a game space, we may begin to bring some political dimension back into the games. Thank you. The title of my talk today, I've um, already gotten a little bit of laughter, um, it's called I'm Queer, Don't Fuck With Me If You're Not. And um, this is a direct quote from a woman that I interviewed for my master's thesis um, at the Oscar Internet Institute last year. Um, and she explains, um, when it, she, she says this when she explains why she describes herself on her Tinder profile as persistently queer and, and picture, pictures of herself in drag. And I, I wanted to, and it's to demonstrate to others, I'm queer, don't fuck with me if you're not. And I wanted to begin with this quote, um, because it provides some insight into what I'll be speaking about today. Um, so I'm going to be speaking about queer women's use of mobile dating apps, specifically on Tinder. Um, and I'm going to explore this need to be explicit in presenting queerness and why it arises, and kind of the troublesome implications that it has on the diversity of queer identity. So, since we're at a queer relationships panel at an internet conference, I'm sure many people are familiar with this myriad of dating and on online mobile dating apps um, that anyone seeking any sort of relationship might use. Um, and some of you might also be wondering why I decided to focus on LGBTQ plus women on Tinder, an application with the reputation of being the grinder for straight people. Um, and the reason it really started is that as a queer woman who has used many of these apps on the screen. Um, I, I was starting to see something really interesting happening on Tinder amongst women seeking women. Um, so it seemed to me that um, kind of all we were just hearing that there was this, this, this need to, to reclaim this space um, in this hetero-focused app and make this work for, their own, for people's own gender and, um, and sexual identity. And I wasn't really the only person that started to notice this. Um, Autostraddle, a website for LGBTQ women, published an article in 2015 on how and why women could queer their tech up um, within, to better utilize mobile and online dating apps that might not have been designed 
with their sexual and gender identity in mind, and with a specific focus on Tinder. And, and this poster is actually a call from a zine asking people to send in stories of how they are making Tinder work for their body, their queerness, and their self, even though it was made with hetero hearts in mind. Um, so there seems to be this clear ownership and shaping of the technology by this community, and I was really curious to see how women were interacting with this technology and finding out more of how they are shaping this app that is so heterosexual in its founding and, and features. And so in order to do this, I um, conducted a study with 17 participants between the ages of 18 35, and 35 living, living in Oxford and London who identified with the female gender in some way and were pursuing other people who identified with the female gender um, that also actively used Tinder for some of their pursuits. And part of what I found really did confirm this idea of repurposing that I was hearing about and seeing by myself and also um, reading about. Um, that people, um, you know, so on Tinder, and you can set your gender as identifying as female um, in some way and also set your gender preferences as interested in women. And in doing this act, what we saw, what I saw was women saw themselves being transporting from kind of this hetero section of the app and, and entering this other space um, with certain expectations that they might have for others on the platform. So you see in this quote, I just assume that if you're on gay Tinder, then you're gay. So there's this, this naming of this new place that really is just the flip of one button. Um, and with it, this assumption that if you're here, you're, 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 um, you're being, making a very strong statement about yourself and your sexual identity. Um, and so this really does seem to demonstrate that they're making the space their own and shaping the technology, um, in part by adding meaning to this really particular feature um, that you know, app developers might not have really thought very intentionally about what this might mean, but to to certain folks in this space, it, it really it um, is exemplifying a, a change to a whole new space. Um, but it really wasn't so simple to say that women have repurposed this platform and reclaimed this platform and are shaping it themselves. Um, and this is in part because um, while they did see this app, this part of the space as separate. Um, they also viewed it as permeable by other users. So participants describe themselves being bombarded by heterosexual users, specifically men, couples, and heterosexual women onto gay Tinder. Um, and as demonstrated by this quote, it's really seen as a, a again, a breach into this space. However, um, in the way that the, the switching of profile preferences by people brought a lot of meaning to this community, um, it also kind of enabled these other possibilities of permeability. So for example, the, the swipe right, swipe left feature um, invites users to swipe through many profiles quickly. And people um, that were that participants described feeling that this feature was being manipulated by um, other people, um, that they would put female, identi female identified for people first, and then um, participants would, would feel duped because they would swipe on them thinking that they were speaking to a, um, a, another queer identified woman and would get stuck and bombarded by like, sexual advances and messages. Um, and they also described a, sim a similar permeability with regards to breaches by cis men or perceived cis heterosexual women. Um, so on Tinder, again, with this changing of preferences with the switch of, simple switch of a button back and forth, um, they also believe that it invited these other folks um, that, you know, might not identify as queer, um, and sometimes men who set their gender incorrectly, not just because they identify differently, but just because. It, it really invited this ability to make these changes very quickly. Um, so while women brought a lot of meaning to this, it also ended up being a double-edged sword because it invites this kind of permeability. And so in reaction to that, um, women had to work against this um, affordance in, this, um, in a different way. And so in response to this permeability um, is really where this comes up of this need to present yourself in a certain way. Um, and this is where you can see that. So there are women looking for women on the app that are not interested romantically in women. And that's why there is a certain aspect of trying to look queer when you're on your Tinder profile. Um, this manifested in a lot of ways. Um, 11 out of the 17 people I talked to um, believe that they expressed queerness explicitly through their profile, through things, something like emoji, pride flags, um, and being, um, or pictures of them at Pride or in drag. Um, there's also a series of cultural queer references, um, such as RuPaul's Drag Race, or like my personal favorite, which is a super deep cut reference 
um, where participants said they, they used the term clandestine glove lunch, which took me a minute, <laughs> but it is a reference to a 2016 parody sketch of the movie Carol featuring Wanda Sykes, Jane Lynch, and Kate McKinnon. So there are these really clear, these really like unique signals that women are using to, to describe, to, to um, signal to others on the app that they are part of this gay Tinder. Um, and so that's really what brings us back to this quote, this, I'm queer, don't fuck with me if you're not. Because in response to this um, permeability, this queer performance becomes a way to legitimize one's queerness to others and ward off intruders within the space. And as this quote demonstrates, the hope is that if you put these signs out there and people comment on them, then there's someone worth pursuing something with. Because there will common ground, there'll be common ground in the sense that they know what that means. However, this, this need to legitimize and the cues that are being used reflect a really limited and primarily in lesbian shared culture. So despite participants describing themselves as many different places on the queer spectrum, um, they called this space gay tinder um, and they looked for signs that someone was definitely gay. And, and so on the other side of this legitimacy coin, some women who didn't really fit into this expected presentation had to constantly work to defend themselves as gay enough if they didn't meet this sort of narrow presentation. Um, and other women who felt the need to actually hide that they might be viewing other, pursuing other genders on the app um, because they would be perceived as intruders themselves. Um, so the response to this perception of permeability um, actually reinforces lesbian identity as a fixed space while delegitimizing non-monosexual women, um, sometimes including trans, excluding trans individuals and disregarding the fluid nature of sexual and gender identity. So to sum up some of these findings, um, one of the main things is that this, this concept of gay tinder, this space, is really birthed from a mutual shaping of queer women in platform performances. Well, women add meaning to this switch of the button um, and socially construct this space for themselves. At the same time, they have to be reactive to this same, um, this same affordance. Um, and this, it's the interplay of these things and the, the expectation that people have for others on it that leads to the birth of this place with certain norms and expectations. And one of these a very, um, uh, what's happening? Oh yeah, and one of these norms and expectations is the need to authentic authenticize, authenticate yourself as legitimately gay. And the way that this authentication plays out in practice is that it leads to the um, reinforcement of a fixed lesbian identity uh, that can be exclusive of the diversity of queer experience. Um, and so kind of like in conclusion, I want to really highlight some of the wider implications beyond the particularities of Tinder. Um, so one of the things of, about this mutual shaping is I feel like we often go hard on one side of technological determinism um, and, and I think that this work builds a lot on Orlikowski's work who, who made the case that this shaping is mutual um, and that, you know, there are, despite, there are design decisions that may work to disenfranchise certain identities, but people are resilient to reclaiming tech. Um, however, there are also limitations to this. And also, we often discuss how alienated um, having the choice between male or female can be on a form and, and the way that this, this alienates individuals that might not fit into these normative structures that we've created within the technology. Um, but I also hope that through this talk, I've also highlighted that it's not just this alienation, but the, the interaction between the design and the users can also end up defining and shaping aspects of a shared identity. Um, and in this case, it ends up being quite limiting um, for, for people that are outside a sort of shared lesbian identity. So thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Maddie, and um, I have to thank whoever decided the order of these presentations, because everything that's said in both of those, you should bring into mind. Um, so I am um, a game designer um, and also um, into design research. Um, but this particular um, uh, project and presentation is about autoethnography um, of my own experience on dating apps, but my lens is through game design. And so please bring in, especially with that last quote about the affordances of digital technology being a two way street we're going to explore today. Um, cool. 
Oh, I should um, warn, content warning, I'm going to be talking about um, as, uh, sexually explicit things, um, and there is graphic language, um, just in case you're not in the mood for that. <laughs> uh, so I just want to uh, start off with, um, you know, some definitions in a very academic sense. Um, so catfish, if you're not uh, familiar with the term, is um, some is a, is a is an accusation of someone who is pretending to be someone that they're not, usually on the internet. Um, if you've seen the TV show, um, catfish is like a kind of cultural phenomenon of. Um, Overall, um, people with the internet, the larger part of our lives, how do we decide who is authentic? Um, and I have a very personal relationship to this term. Um, so I publicly identify as trans, and being trans makes you an automatic catfish, no matter what. And so catfish is not just being explicitly someone who is trying to dupe another person, but have, calls into question just authenticity on a very deep level. So I have to kind of go around, um, this is an autoethnography, so I'll be talking about my experience in dating apps. Um, I have to kind of go around on dating apps thinking about these multiple levels of authenticity. Um, and what does it mean to kind of be like a real woman? So um, just to kind of set some context um, for the past, uh, ever since uh, Tinder and other dating apps have been around, um, trans women in particular have been um, banned wholesale from these apps. And this is particularly because users are able to use a reporting feature to report them without um, any consequence. And in particular, this is because they were seen as fake profiles. So for a very long time, trans women, and this is a very specifically towards trans women, um, and whenever I say men, I mean cisgender men, um, other genders are kind of outside the purview of this, of this talk for now. Um, so with trans, so trans women are being just um, wiped out of dating apps um, for a very long time until about like a year or two ago when many news stories ran about trans women being wholesale uh, banned. I had um, my Tinder profile banned before. Um, I currently have a live one, but I have three other um, um, other profiles that are now recently banned. And if you want to know why I'm being banned so often, you can ask me later. But <laughs> but but overall, um, the kind of the, the relationship with this is that people are able to gain the system of technology and its affordances to invisibilize trans women. Um, and this serves a very specific purpose, but I want to um, dive a little bit deeper because this is not just a say swipe apps. Um, this also exists on our um, on on the internet. So here, if you look in the red box, this is on Reddit. Um, and in personal ads, um, it's very uh, there's um, kind of a, a user generated rules that force trans people to self identify, particularly as T as trans. However, trans people, um, you see how it goes like male, female, transgender, like trans people uh, <laughs> can't be reduced to just one category, right? But what that does is that it puts all trans people into an avoidable category. You're able to invisibilize them by not allowing them to self-identify as men and women if they so choose to. So what this usually means is that trans people on dating apps and personals are only available to people who are very specifically seeking them out. Um, in queer cultures, um, people might be familiar with the term chaser, um, and other and other cultures also are familiar with chaser. But that usually means that pe chasers um, are the people who use this sort of, um, for them, you know, as a, in my in my ethnography, a large group of people who use um, T as a useful way of finding trans women or chasers, specifically because they want to encounter a very particular kind of body and do very particular kind of acts. And in general, trans people do not like that. That is not something that trans people want, enjoy, or um, believe is useful. So that means that this sort of categorization um, is not useful for trans people, it's useful for cis people, particularly cisgender men. Um, and so just kind of move on to why this is happening. Like, why are these sorts of things being invisibilized? Um, so trans, trans women in particular are made to be invisibilized so their um, company labor can be exploited without um, any sort of retribution. So here is um, a, a conversation that I've been having, I had with someone on a post that I put on, on Reddit. Um, and you can see that there's these three rules. So this is called, um, there's a section of people called discreet, usually discreet people, which not like, it's like EET, not like the other one. Um, so, which I always like typo. Um, but so basically what that means is that someone wants to have a sexual encounter without any sort of paper trail. 
But what that usually means for trans people is that they create a very unsafe um, uh, uh, environment in where abuse and murder can happen. Um, and as someone who has, um, in, has uh, experienced uh, sexual abuse and near life experiences in these sorts of situations, um, it's really important to kind of consider what is going on with this. So here are some examples. So um, here is someone who is, um, you know, very specifically says, does not want to talk about themselves at all. Can't because obviously they're attached and they can't let other people know that they are um, being with trans women. Um, asking me if I was alone and very, if I lived alone and in what neighborhood, meaning that I would be isolated and alone with this person who I do not know. And this person also does not share fixed pictures, of course, so they're not identifiable either. Um, and then this person who even wanting to do, um, like, you know, to kind of meet to see if, you know, usually what you do is you meet for drinks and then maybe you go to a private, you know, place. Um, this person instead was like, no, can I come to your house directly? Because I'm, yeah, exactly, no. <laughs> you do not. So basically, um, so basically, um, what this is essentially, uh, and this is not a rare, like this might seem like it's a rare thing. This is, this is actually like the 99.999% of people who encounter me on the internet say to me. Um, and this is because uh, dating and having sex with trans women is taboo. We still live in a society in which this is like something that everyone shares, no matter how liberal or conservative you are, you are ashamed of loving or having sex with trans women. However, there's another aspect of this. Um, so here is um, a you know, word uh, called trap, and this is around the idea of passability. And that is how passable is, or how much can a trans woman uh, pass as not being transgender? As in, if she goes outside, no one can tell that she is trans. Um, and this is a highly desirable feature of trans women. And most, um, and most men will not encounter or deal with women who are not passable. Um, and the thing that's really uh, that's needed for this, um, I like to add for this, by the way. Um, and the thing that is about that's interesting about this is that um, tr there is a very specific culture around wanting traps, in that men need an excuse in order to have sex with trans women, which is they are tricked into it, right? She was so passable, she was very hot, and you can see from these examples that um, that there is. Uh, heterosexual cisgender men trying to find a way to socially have a socially acceptable counter with trans women. And it's very particularly through this, um, you know, this particular um, device of being a trap. Um, and these spaces are not necessarily like, uh, the thing that's, about, that's interesting about these spaces is that despite being violent, you know, in nature, they're also actually therapeutic for, um, particularly for uh, cisgender men. So um, many, many of my encounters feel like therapy for the other person in which they are telling me about a lot of things that they can't express in their daily lives. And so there's this interesting, um, there's this interesting, um, phenomenon of after all this like shady, um, dangerous um, negotiations that eventually at the end, this is cisgender men um, ways of trying to find a time to be vulnerable and actually express themselves or express things at a very deep level. Um, and now that the internet exists and trans women can talk to each other in a safe <laughs> way, we start to find out that there are networks of trans women who are essentially having, uh, who are essentially sh ha uh, having cisgender men practice more progressive identities by basically having sex with a bunch of them. And so there was a point in time where I was just like, I just need to like go be chased and like never talk to men again. Mm -hmm. But I do start to realize that in this very strange way, when I encounter men in this way, the next trans woman who encounters them will have a better experience. And there's like this very interesting movement where people think that like, we are just becoming progressive because of time. However, we're becoming progressive because of labor. So through a whole bunch of sexual labor, I can't thank you. <laughs> Where's my check? Um, um, so through a bunch of sexual labor, we are um, moving, having movements go forward, um, not just in the sort of like you know temporal sense. I had to go through this. Okay, cool. So third act. I, I haven't been saying the acts. I'm sorry. I got distracted. But my third act is that I actually created an actual catfish account um, to go onto dating apps to talk to men and create other therapeutic spaces that didn't involve the endangerment of my life. And so what I did was I um, basically just copied and pasted my profile that made it a white cisgender woman. Um, and we had conversations about masculinity. Um, and so here are just some quotes. Um, 
in, in particular, um, what has been really interesting about this, and I kind of see this as a, an extent of my work, as an intervention. Um, for games people, I feel like I'm modding a game system uh, via my own self. Um, and so what's been going on is that I've been going and having these particular kinds of conversations. And the only reason that can happen is because I don't appear to be a trans woman, um, particularly because I'm not a trans woman of color as well. Um, and so we're able to have these sorts of, of these sorts of conversations. Um, and it's actually like, I, and it actually is very transformative for me too. Um, I didn't realize how kind men could be <laughs> until I was not trans. Um, and that's been actually a very interesting way, and I can't really talk about that right now given the amount of time I have, but um, it's, there's a very interesting way of how I now renegotiated my relationship with my body the moment I was I became catfish on purpose. Um, and so I'm, I'm trying to like evoke, um, uh, so the, the, there's this um, art manifesto called the Manifesto for Maintenance Art, 1969, by um, Meryl Laterman uh, Ukelis, and this is about, um, how much activism in art is very focused on prioritizing public um, transformative art as opposed to the maintenance that allows society and political um, factions to function. So for instance, when you go out to protest, who cooks you dinner afterwards? Um, there's that kind of relationship of the maintenance of everyday life that makes larger um, public and potentially more masculinized versions of politics um, more uh, able or possible, but is not treated as art or action in itself. And so I see this as my own contribution to maintenance art in that I'm trying to figure out like, what is this game and system of of, um, of progression, of like, let's say either queer, I don't even know what this is. I wouldn't say these are queer people, but um, I would say that, I, that, that something is going on in order to have these sorts of conversations. Um, and I even have been like doing um, like sex ed, like very basic sex ed on here too. Um, so like, it's really interesting to me about thinking about like the, the agent as a mod. So I kind of in a weird way do like, as a catfish, using catfish in this very particular way, um, has kind of evolved the sort of like bots because for a lot of for a lot of men on social dating sites, you don't know whether or not the person you're speaking to is human or non-human, and so there's becomes this very interesting um, this very interesting relationship when you are a catfish because while you are human, you're not the thing that you're talking that you're you're supposed to be. And I'm really interested in what does it mean to inter for like a, a form of intervention that everyone can do. And while technically, yeah, like this is like might not be the most kosher thing to do. Um, there is lying involved, um, and I can answer more about that later. But I would say that um, out of all the people who have like time and energy to burn and contribute towards like social liber you know, liberation, so gender men are on the top of that list. <laughs> So I feel like if it comes to like how can we intervene in these spaces, um, using the sort of um, intervention method might be useful. Um, so in conclusion, um, I feel like uh, there is like this new relationship for me um, with social dating apps and the design of them. Uh, but in particular, what does it mean to to exist on these platforms with any political stance whatsoever? Um, in, in essence, we are very concerned with public discourse, even if it's anonymized, even if we have multiple identities. I feel like here in particular, we have this idea of public um, civility or being a citizen in public. However, I have, through my experience, I find that the greatest political action I've been doing are, is in private and in bedrooms. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name's Aaron. Um, you guys are all probably thinking like, who the hell like taught this 14 year old to start talking about sex? <laughs> but, um, I'm here, so I'm, also, I'm kind of thinking the same thing. And the, the big kind of letdown of this presentation is that I'm not really going to be talking about sex that much. I'm kind of using libido rhetorically and like uh, synecdotically to talk about uh, like libidinality, um, or like desire more generally as it flows um, through like sexual and non-sexual spaces. Um, so to kind of like, uh, to pioneer like this like um, project, I kind of pulled a few uh, registers of desire that we should kind of be thinking about as uh, I pull in more examples, etc. And so um, I'm using desire more generally here 
as the machine of production of worlds themselves, um, and as that which may or may not attune bodies to larger circuits of capital. So here we see desire less in terms of just sexual desire, but the type of bodily energy, what some scholars call vital energy, uh, that's necessary for capital's continuous propulsion. Um, in other words, as many people have noted, the forces of reproduction necessary for capital to keep going every day, um, that's what we identify as desire. And so uh, in this presentation, I guess I'll be toggling between both registers of desire, both sexual and this kind of like vital instrumental desire that's kind of distributed throughout the population um, to talk about uh, the emergence of new forms of media, just because um, I feel that it's weird because new media offers this new platform of convergence between these two registers, registers of desire where uh, increasingly we see desire propelled into platforms uh, in terms of commodities. Uh, we see like uh, greater appeals to advertising, uh, that, uh, that type of stuff. And also uh, with the emergence of apps and platforms that have allowed us to gain a greater connectivity with others around the world that in many times manifests itself in sexual ways. Um, so here's like the kind of really shitty drawing that I, uh, I made for today. And uh, this is kind of uh, an illustration of what I was talking about, um, <laughs> uh, wherein kind of like both mental and libidinal forces are kind of like factoring into the production of worlds themselves. Um, so we see how, you know, like on an everyday level, like a lot of our actions, a lot of our wills are what kind of like shores up uh, the structures that we actually inhabit every day. Um, uh, and that was like the best picture I could find of like a world. But um, <laughs> in terms of talking about new media, I guess I was a little bit too lazy to put in uh, this like animation thing that I kind of wanted to do, but um, I just didn't really know how to do that. Um, I wanted to put in like a phone somewhere in here or like a computer screen somewhere in here in order to talk about how uh, new media platforms are increasingly increasingly becoming um, uh, a mediation tool between the individual body and like larger social formations. Um, and increasingly, uh, they actually facilitate the speed at which these uh, connections are forged. Um, so, let's see. Okay, so uh, now that we've kind of like established desire both as like sexual desire and something that's like generative of the world of capitalism and what we inhabit, um, I kind of wanted to take this um, framework into a general incursion into media studies um, and uh, new media and like the arising web in general because uh, if desire is a practice, I feel like a big uh, sense of self-reflexivity is missing in a lot of these kind of like academic conferences um, in terms of like, uh, like what is propelling us to be here, like what networks of desire uh, beyond like an aesthetic level um, are situating us here, like at the Museum of the Moving Image, talking about sex. So, um, so yeah. Um, and as like a central case study, I guess I'm going to be using Grinder, uh, even though I have like little to no experience on Grinder. I've, I've used it a few times, but um, I like to think of it as like an ethnography or something. Um, so I'm going to be trying to kind of like map desire onto these like circulation of images, videos, uh, and mass media. And the thing that really inspired me to do this was um, uh, Hito Cheryl, like the Berlin artist, uh, article in Uflux, uh, uh, something, it's something about the poor image, I forgot. It's in, in defense of the poor image, there we go. Um, so I'll just like read a quote for you guys. Um, poor images are the contemporary wretched of the screen, the debris of audiovisual production, the trash that washes up on digital economy shores. They testify to the violent dislocation transferals and displacement of images, their acceleration and circulation within the vicious cycles of audiovisual capitalism. Poor images are dragged around the globe as commodities or their effigies, as gifts or as bounty. They spread pleasure or death threats, conspiracy theories or bootlegs, resistance or stultification. Poor images show the rare, the obvious, and the unbelievable, that is, if we can still manage to decipher it. Um, so honestly, before this project even began, the minute I read this, for some reason, I just like thought of Grindr because uh, Grindr kind of uh, encapsulates well aesthetically that like web of poor images that you're kind of just like circulating through uh, at a month. Um, and so to embark on kind of like an aesthetic formal analysis of Grindr's interface, 
Um, this is a kind of bad representation of it because it's like a, it's like promotional materials from like Grindr's website itself. But if you ever use like any dating app like Tinder or Grindr, you know that the quality of your photo that's like actually uploaded to the app is much worse than the quality that's like actually that you like begin with. Um, and a lot of times it becomes like pixelated um, and like blurred to a point that like you don't really like look like yourself. Um, so you have to like kind of like self monitor all the time. Um, and so in that you kind of see this like collapse um, of the postmodern between like form and content in which um, it's really hard to distinguish between like um, the power of the image itself and like what's contained inside it. And so uh, to solve this problem, of course, because it takes uh, less space like in the cloud or whatever, I don't know, um, Grindr uh, provides these like categories uh, for you to like determine yourself uh, within or against. Um, so you have a bio, you have like uh, your weight, your height, your race, uh, your type, your relationship status, uh, whether you want to be on Grindr for dates, friends, networking, there's like a lot of really crazy options on it. Um, <laughs> uh, and then like what type of gay you are. So like, <laughs> um, this person is, um, I can't read it, so I see jock at the bottom, but I can't read the, the clean cut, cut uh, geek. Okay, so uh, <laughs> I guess like what I'm trying to get at here is, um, along with the combination of desire uh, as that which propels capitalism, um, it's actually the, the desire of these categories itself that interacts uh, with the flows of capital uh, that Grindr circulates in. And I'm just gonna pull up a very like uh, uh, broad example of um, how this works. So this is like Grindr's revenue from 2015 and uh, it's expected to almost, it's not almost tripling, but it's growing a lot. Uh, uh, to the point where it's going to be worth $90 million in 2018. Um, and so this is kind of like the keystone of my project because I just want to stress that this like probably isn't some like Vogue or like BuzzFeed article about like how Grindr and Tinder are fucked up because there's like a lot of that. Um, and like really important critiques obviously, like they, they provide a lot of information. Um, but I'm personally kind of more invested in the ways that uh, our relation to these media platforms are kind of like harnessed and uh, and then super adequated into like larger forms of value circulation and production. Um, so if you want to envision this kind of like hermetic circle that like goes around and around, where we're like kind of like playing into these categories um, of race, sexuality, gender, blah blah blah, um, and then the revenue that Grindr makes um, as a result as, as a result of like advertisements, etc., um, that they later use for uh, like their own purposes through like financial speculation and derivatives that continue to augment their own revenue. Um, and then their power grows as like a platform, uh, and then we like play into it again because it's like it grows in power and size and like uh, popularity, and then it keeps going. It's like this like endless cycle. Um, so that that's like kind of the the world vision that I'm trying to play in right now, um, and it's like evidenced through both the, the revenues of Grinder and like Tinder, Facebook, etc., and also the like coeval coincident um, disappearance of like. Uh, more capillary and like free form forms of um, online cruising that used to be there. Um, so now when we think of like online dating, we're only able to think of like Tinder, Grindr, OkCupid, her, I don't know, things like that. Um, and so you have these like larger regimes of corporations that are taking up a lot more sexual and mental space um, and aug augmenting their power through the appropriation of categories of analysis that we use in our social formations every day. Um, so that's kind of like how uh, I want to situate like a form of critique. Um, so here I kind of like laid out a few like ideas I've been thinking about uh, in terms of critique. It's really hard to think about it in, in like material terms when everything's like on the web. Um, and a lot of like data about kind of like financialization uh, and platform development is kind of like hidden from public view. Um, but a lot of these uh, criticisms and like ways of uh, subversion are like working on how capitalism actively like deploys categories of social formation um, into like its own vehicle for transference and uh, accumulation. So uh, the first one is drawn from Jonathan Bowler's uh, The Message is Murder, Substrates of Computational Capital, uh, where he kind of identifies and uh, critiques the original um, Marxist formulation of money, commodity, money, where the commodity is like the mediator between like the money and like the, the growing augmenting money form. Um, and he's, he changes C to I because information is kind of like a broader uh, umbrella with 
which to think about um, how value is produced and augmented. Um, and it also encapsulates like the affective, like emotional routes with which we like imbue value and increase value um, of products and feelings and uh, services over time. Um, so in his in one of his chapters, he espouses a form of data flow disruption, which I like have a hard time wrapping my, my mind around, but uh, basically espousing like practices that uh, disrupt uh, this like capture of data that is so necessary for grinders revenue to keep going and to keep augmenting. Um, so whether that be kind of like uh, refusal to like adhere to these categories or fill in the forms, uh, that's probably like what I am thinking of. And in terms of like online services, I'm thinking like ad blockers and things like that kind of like facilitate that uh, blockage of uh, continual flow of advertisement to user, to advertisement to user, to money, et cetera. Um, and then uh, I guess like another critique I had uh, was like uh, uses of absurdity in terms of like aesthetic categories. Um, and this is drawn from CNI's Our Aesthetic Categories, who draws at length from Adorno's aesthetic theory to think about how we can like subvert normative aesthetic categories um, and our like, as Ron CNI might call it, like our distribution of the sensible uh, in favor of aesthetics that might uh, encourage us to think about our world differently. And so I don't know how that happens, but um, I guess that means like uploading pictures of yourself that aren't yourself, or like uploading crazy pictures of yourself, um, things like that. I still have yet to brainstorm. Um, so those are kind of like things I want to uh, leave you guys off with. And then to kind of like finally consider a like dialogical approach with the rest of these presentations. I think that Tommy really like brilliantly envisioned uh, queer heterotopia within the world of like video games and virtual realities. Um, and what I'm kind of wondering now as a final question is within the world of like the web, I guess specifically where everything is kind of entangled within one circuit of, um, of capital circulation, especially because like the, the web is like always posited to be like this free thing as we've um, seen from like discourses of net neutrality, et cetera, but you like, like everyone forgets that they pay like 60 bucks a month for the web, you know, like, I don't know. <laughs> um, so anyway, like in this, like, uh, in this specific sphere of like social interaction on the web, like how do we envision an escape or how do we envision a uh, queer heterotopia as Foucault and Munoz might call it. Um, so that's like my kind of final uh, question for you guys. Thanks. All right, I would like to invite all the panelists to come and sit on the panel. Okay, is there anyone in the audience who wants to start off with the first question? Um, you alluded to this uh, when I called you out. Would you feel comfortable sharing why you got banned from Tinder? Oh, yeah. Um, well, I, got, I mean, I got banned from more than one just Tinder. So uh, <laughs> currently, I am banned from um, Field, I'm banned from OkCupid, okay and I'm banned. I forgot, there's a third one that I'm banned from. But now, for some, for some reason, I'm on Tinder. But I think that's because there's a lawsuit against Tinder right now about banning trans women right now. So I feel like I no one's being, maybe no one's being banned, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but the reason I guess I'm being banned is because um, I refuse to self-identify as transgender in the um, categories. Um, instead, I say that I'm trans in my description. However, that is still kind of seen at, like, I actually, um, uh, so Field, if people are not familiar, is like, they're trying to be like somewhat like lefty, like dating, you know, type thing. Um, meaning they're like poly, like centered and all this other type of stuff. Um, and when they recently relaunched this year, um, they decided to rebrand the trans category as beyond, like B. And I was just like, okay, look, like, there's, there's man, woman, and trans, and look, I, I can't ask for so much, I'll, I'll keep the tea. But the moment they went to, like, beyond, it was obviously, like, some cisgender people deciding, this is, like, you know, gender is no more, right? So I, I wrote them a message. And I was like, hey, like, you know, here's the situation. Um, if you kind of, you know, force uh, cisgender people to, ha to not identify as men and women, but as, like, like um, not beyond, I don't know, like something else, like <laughs> you would have people mad at you and you would change it back. So like, please allow me to identify as a woman 
um, and not as trans. And so eventually they kind of, re they actually reverted it back to, to T. However, I decided that I, that wasn't enough for me personally. I deleted it, remade my profile, was a woman that got banned. And so that's kind of, um, that, I think that also happened with, um, oh, that also happened with OkCupid as well. Funny enough, my catfish accounts are still alive, they're not banned. <laughs> <laughs> so interesting. Okay, what other questions do we have? Wow, it's so quiet. I have a kind of a comment on that banning thing, because mm -hmm. I think it's really interesting because actually a lot of time is policed by the users yeah. and not mm -hmm. really by the app itself. Like I recently had a post removed from Instagram. Um, it featured a digital butt, like a, mm -hmm. like a male avatar. Okay. I made a game, a bathhouse game, and it featured like a naked man and it was like, a picture of his butt. Mm -hmm. And that post got removed. And like, there's no way Instagram sifts through, like I, I've seen porn on Instagram. I know that exists and I know people don't get things removed because Instagram is not like actively looking and seeking these out. Mm -hmm. But like, it's policed by the users. Like people report each other which is kind of the case that you kind of briefly mentioned in your talk as well. I think that's really interesting. There's this like making us monitor each other and banning each other is yeah. really problematic. I actually think that they do, they do monitor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, you can go ahead. No, I think it's a recent change though. Yeah. I don't know how recent this is, but I mean, yeah. you can speak to that. Uh, I mean, just from within the porn community, yeah. um, there's mm -hmm. been like a really massive shift like recently, like uh, coinciding with Fosta Sesta, even though like right. it's not directly. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, remember Instagram's owned by Facebook. They have incredibly powerful facial recognition technology. Mm -hmm. You true, basically true. use the same technology for like boobs and butt. Um, we've noticed like in the porn community that um, just very recently, last mm -hmm. um, three weeks or so. Um, people are starting to get auto deletions. So you post it and a second later it's immediately deleted right. for mm -hmm. violation. So there's no, it never even went out to people. Right, right, right. Um, so you may be fine, but of course it, that doesn't make it any, yeah, 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 yeah. But, but there's a whole new uh, layer to it. I think yeah. that's what we're considering now yeah. um, that I think um, a lot of times these policies aren't even clearly articulated. Mm -hmm. They just start happening and yeah. we have to figure out what they're happening and why. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I will say that in, in case of all the times I've been banned, um, they were definitely from users. Yeah. In order, in particularly the gender men trying to put me back into the categories that I belong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Um, I don't really know how to phrase this because I... I don't work in the same discipline that much, so apologies if I use like incorrect language or say something. Um, but there's been a lot of uh, work on concern around faking of identities and how artificial intelligence is helping that become like a really realistic interpretation of people, particularly with the introduction of video and voice, and how it's now we're reaching an age where it's actually become really hard to identify people's true identities. Um, and so I was wondering what that meant for the queer community and how that like affected your sense of safety online and worries about ever getting to the true or if it was seen as like something to help you represent yourselves in a certain way and like what kind of challenges that brought up for operating in digital space. Um, just like, I don't know if it's really a direct answer to your question, but I think it's really interesting because you kind of touched upon that too in your talk about catfishing and like on purposely catfishing and I immediately thought of Turing and I immediately thought of the imitation game and how like the idea of faking, it has this really queer history, um, like Turing as a gay man, uh, his, the Turing test um, proved that the intelligence of computers because um, the computer was able to trick the user uh, to think that, that, that the computer was human. And um, it came from sort of his experience as a gay man in, in England where homosexuality was illegal. Um, so this idea of passing is, has this really interesting queer history, but I, it's not really a, I, I mean, I understand you have like issues of, with safety as well, but um, I don't know, I just think it's a really interesting history that sometimes people forget about. Um, I would say in particular, um, I don't feel like people being who they are, at least like publicly on the internet, 
is really like a safety uh, like a thing that helps me in the sense of like the reason why um, a lot of these categorizations are just further for controlling how people exist at all, right? Mm -hmm. So for instance, on Facebook, I mean, maybe this was too long ago, but um, when the real name policy came up, like that endangered sex workers and, mm -hmm. and people in the porn industry and trans people and basically anybody who needed to not have the internet uh, persona and their real life persona match yeah. And that is like disproportionately, I mean, you feel like it disproportionately affects queer people to non queer people. Um, I mean, I'm fortunate in the sense that I am I am out and I don't, and I, I've, I've moved along my life in which that would not hurt me. However, um, I have been in situations in where being identified easily on the internet has led to people being able to harass me. Mm -hmm. So maybe, I mean, like, I feel like um, I don't, I'm not entirely sure what uh, like authenticating people is really useful for outside uh, for, for a person to person thing outside of a very like you know very mobilized other people so for instance men really want to make sure that women are real because they are looking to extract something very particular particular from that person mm -hmm. right and so they have to kind of like identify like over and over so the verification picture and then the instagram connection and then like every single thing there's so many tests to go through to prove that like you know, well, yeah, anything. So I don't know. Like, I feel like um, there. I feel like all forms of safety, um, all, all forms of kind of like uh, advertising safety has other more insidious, insidious uh, agenda. In my experience. Other questions. I'll just I'll just talk then. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I actually thought that all of your guys' presentations were really interesting. And um, I think that a lot of what you were saying about the internet um, and um, emotional labor was really interesting because I come out of a sex work uh, milieu and it seems like so, uh, so much of what you were talking about in terms of dating, like, and the emotional labor that gets put into, uh, into that get, is, like parallels the work that I've done as well. Okay. So I think that's all. I thought what you had to say was really interesting. Yes. Well, I, oh, oh, no, you can respond well, to that. Well, I very quickly say that um, because I am, I don't do actual sex work and, and therefore in a, in a very literal sense and I don't like have that struggle, like trans women are automatically kind of like, implicated into like all sex work conversations. Sure. Mm -hmm. And also I do believe what I am doing is sex work in the abstract. Yeah. So yeah, there's a whole <laughs> bunch of uh, stuff intersecting and that's a fruitful conversation people want to go that way. Yeah, that's what I was actually yeah, thinking. Cool. That I could kind of take my experiences and just map them right on top yeah. of yours, which is really interesting actually, um, coming from totally different like positionalities. Um, hi, my name is Bodhi. My question is kind of uh, for Tom, Tom, but for everybody, uh, if you feel you can answer. But um, I pr really appreciated your um, like leaning on like heterotopia and like play or like the magic circle as like a way for like um, queer spaces to be created and like ha for queer sociality to happen. Um, and I appreciated the examples that you had um, from like a single player or like narrative standpoint of like exploration of what that might look like through like new media technologies. Um, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts or anybody else have any thoughts on um, new media technologies that have like a kind of more co-social leaning that allow for like this kind of magic circle to be created. Um, it seems like dating apps maybe might not be that uh, place for more like free like play to um, happen. Um, do you have like thoughts about like places like MMOs or like yeah. role play forums or like yeah. places like that? Yeah, um, I think MMOs like especially while wow, World of Warcraft has been like extensively documented by queer theorists and uh, especially in queer game studies. Um, I on purposely chose not to talk about MMOs just because it's so extensively talked about. Um, because it's like it, the possibilities for them to have queer relationships are obvious. But um, I, I have one example where um, uh, in, in War World of Warcraft, uh, a player didn't like leveled up to the maximum level, which at that time I believe was level 85 without killing a single person. Or like all that person did was collect herbs like discover new areas, um, like met people, and like didn't kill a single thing. And all that person did was, and it got to the highest level, was just through like pa passive pacifist sort of acts, which I thought was super interesting and it has these like queer implications as well, mm -hmm. um, but not necessarily queer in itself, like in its content. Um, but MMOs, like yeah, I, I I think they're they have their sort of 
great arenas for queer relationships to happen. I'll just very quickly say, um, if you're willing to not like be, I mean, this happens on the internet, but also doesn't have to be. Um, in general, things like kink and BDSM have mm -hmm. been a very strong yes. part of queer communities. Mm -hmm. um, they're very, um, co they, they are a series of rules that create a situation in which people do what they wish and then leave in part, hopefully not abused. And so I feel like, um, you know, a part of that is uh, there's a lot of, especially if you're asking this from a games perspective, there's a lot, um, there's a lot of games perspective and interaction design type stuff that can kind of go in there, where I feel like people can co-create whatever they want. Um, it doesn't require the web. Yeah, there's some, I forgot the name of that game, but it's like a BDSM game where it's completely co-created by its user and it's mostly narrative driven and you like choose your character and you can choose like penis size or like no penis, like you can completely change the way your avatar looks and then the stories of how I have to find out that name and then get back at you maybe after this is done. But I, I remember it being like super popular and it's, um has a lot, a lot of users and players. Um, yeah, I don't know if this is what you're talking about, but I would also check out um, Arena. It's called A R E dot N A. It's kind of this like really, really ridiculous platform that's like very, very like curated, but it's like some uh, interface where like users are like completely anonymous or like don't have like some sort of like social ranking that like coordinates or like maps onto like forms of social capital, and you're just supposed to like co-produce and like share your content. Um, but I'm not on it, so I don't know how it works. <laughs> 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 You're not it. <laughs> Did you have a question? Uh, so platforms like Facebook and Twitter and chat, a lot of the revenue comes from advertisement, whether being uh, political or commercial, other kind of commercial advertisement. How account managers in house that takes the interest of people who basically finance those platforms in mind in terms of next phases or next products and so on. So for example, Facebook and Twitter have in-house Republican and Democrat account managers who actually sit in different buildings and represent like opposing interests into product teams and so on. And I was wondering if like particularly like the queer specific platforms, but not just them, but like, all other uh, platforms that as you uh, hint, and, like outline gain their financial income from um, uh, capitalizing in these interests and uh, uh, kind of aspects of life, how do they engage with the communities beyond individuals laboring and getting in touch with them and trying to correct their product or their marketing or so on? So I was wondering if you have any experience, have any knowledge of that, of how they, they involve uh, the broader community in that discussion? Um, I'd have to think about like what platforms you're talking about. I feel like uh, a lot of queer platforms are like, oriented toward dating. And so the way that like they like mine data is obviously like tied really intrinsically to like sexual preference um, and like other like markers that you like put on your profile in terms of like that type of thing. Um, and I mean, that's kind of the question of it all. It's like, how, how do you like form like a commons or like a, like a public like on the internet without, that encapsulates like a wider variety or like a large fraction of people because like all these like forums, et cetera, are like definitely like spaces where like uh, like commingling and co-creation are free, but they're like also like kind of pushed aside to like the, the peripheries of like uh, the internet. So like how to identify like spaces within kind of like larger platforms uh, that avoid that, that type of like, uh, like social capture of like interests um, is interesting. And it's also interesting to think about how those interests um, don't also naturally arise from the individual, but are also a product of the circulation that Facebook has created, right? So it's like, um, it's not that they're like uh, seizing our interests, but they're actually kind of like also having them emerge at the same time um, within the circle of things. Um, also to add on to that, I feel like from a market perspective, a lot of times queer communities are overlooked um, mm -hmm. in part because like it is a small market. Um, and uh, I think particularly, and this kind of speaks to both kind of this idea of like, queer spaces having to exist alongside in opposition to heterosexual spaces. Um, that's kind of what comes up this, that's in part why there's this need to, to, um, to, to use the spaces that exist and try to queer them yourselves. Um, but there's also been um, some, 
some research done on a, particularly uh, like there's a really great article on um, LGBTQ women on on mobile dating apps and kind of the difficulties of of trying to capture this market. It's thought of as being like unique and different and like nobody understands how women meet each other. <laughs> um, and, and so and, and also that it's kind of because this there's this perception that like women take more time to meet each other. They don't just want to hook up, but there's this like um, it's not really compatible with the kind of um, the kind of t contact that these are trying to design. It's like not so fast paced, um, and also that like uh, there's kind of less of an access to capital, um, which also um, is makes it difficult for these apps to capture or like a lot mm -hmm. of them make money off of people, particularly cis men spending money on them. Yeah. Um, and so if you're not fitting into that category or don't have that access to capital, then it's it's that's it's in part why these spaces have to find people have to find these spaces and make them themselves. Mm -hmm. Where are we at on time? I can't tell where we at, are at on time. Oh. 418. It's 418. So we're done, right? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I'd like to thank you guys for uh, your very good presentation. <laughs>